Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Dave Sampson. I'm the Global Vice Chairman of Corporate Affairs for Edelman. And it's my real pleasure to welcome you to today's page patrons program uh, and webinar. And the, the title of it's Deepening Stakeholder Relationships Through Comtech or through Comtech with Social Chorus. And um, I think we had a really exciting program this morning. And I think um, we're, we're all keenly familiar now with the, the essential role that Comtech is playing as an enabler in our function. Uh, I think I saw a statistic recently from McKinsey that digital adoption has actually leapfrogged ahead by five to six years just since the pandemic broke out. And so Comtech is becoming increasingly important to us as we look to modernize our communications functions and as we look to really uh, deepen our relationship with employees and, and other stakeholders in a more informed um, and meaningful manner. Um, today's webinar is part of a series uh, that we're doing. It's part of the page uh, patrons program, and we kicked off the page patrons program really with the aim of educating people on Comtech because Comtech is becoming such an increasingly important part of everything we do. And so it's really a, a way to start to educate uh, members of page on, on Comtech and how to apply it uh, in the course of our daily jobs. Uh, today's webinar is really made possible from our second page patron, which is Social Chorus. Um, and those of you who don't know Social Course are actually a leader uh, in the industry. And what they're doing is helping companies achieve their business objectives uh, through a communications platform that can actually reach, align, and mobilize uh, every employee across an enterprise or across uh, a company's workforce. Uh, their co-founder and uh, chief strategy officer, Nicole Albino, is going to be leading a conversation today with uh, Orst Holubeck. Uh, Orst is a member of the Page Society. He's the Chief Communications Officer of Providence St. Joseph Health. Um, for those of you who may not know the organization, they're a 25 billion non-for-profit health system with 119,000 caregivers who serve communities, um, health and social services needs across seven states. And uh, Orst has worked with Social Chorus and, and other partners to deepen its stakeholder relationships. And I think he's really um, established himself as a pace setter um, by the page's definition uh, when it comes to applying Comtech uh, in the course of doing his job on behalf of, uh, of Providence. Um, before I turn it over to Orst, who's going to um, kick off the discussion together with Nicole, uh, just a few housekeeping things for folks. Uh, we're, we're taping today's and recording today's uh, webcast so that members who haven't been able to join us can watch it and, and uh, take part in it at their convenience. Um, we also want this to be an interactive hour. So I'm going to ask you to please use the chat function uh, throughout to share any comments, raise any questions you have, um, or indicate if you would like to speak. And then at the end, I'll also be moderating um, a Q&A with Orst and Nicole. And so uh, when I call on your name at the end, and, and again, you're free to raise questions throughout the course of the hour, but at the end, uh, please state your name and uh, organization before you ask your question. Um, also, we'd, we're asking people to keep your cameras on so it feels more inclusive uh, and like an like a open meeting. Um, but also, please keep, if you're not speaking, keep your lines muted. Um, and then finally, um, if there's anybody out there that has a, a great Comtech partner um, that is helping you do your job better, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So send a note to either Kelly Green or myself, and we'll follow up with you afterward. We're looking for other Comtech folks to become page patrons. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Orst, um, and he's going to kick off today's discussion. So Orst, over to you. Dave, thank you uh, so much, and thanks everybody for spending time with us this morning or afternoon or evening, or I don't know uh, where everybody is right now, but one of the beauties of these of the virtual world is we can all get together no matter what time it is. Um, little context before uh, we kick in um, and uh, be before Nicole uh, talks a bit about, uh, or a lot about social chorus, but um, context in our organization. So when I, I started here 10 years ago, uh, we were uh, at about uh, 6 billion in revenues uh, and we've grown to 25 billion over those 10 years and most of that through new store growth. So mergers and acquisitions of other 
not-for-profit health systems. Um, at, at the core, we're a, a Catholic not-for-profit health system, and we have brought on community-based secular partners uh, as well. And uh, as you can all imagine, one of the challenges of this is um, as you bolt on uh, health systems, on the plus side, there were um, geographically contiguous, so we're across seven Western states that are, um, you know, contiguous, uh, but on the challenge side, they're different cultures coming together. Uh, each of them had different communication and marketing uh, structures. Over those 10 years, I've brought those teams together to a single unified team serving across uh, the seven states uh, with accountability for external communication, community relations, crisis communication, media, uh, media relations, social media, uh, obviously organizational communication, reputation management, um, and a few other a few other things here and there. Uh, so what I knew early on uh, was that if we didn't have a way uh, to measure uh, across uh, the enterprise, we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't know if our messaging is effective. We'd know anecdotally, or we can do little um, focus groups or experiments on measurement here and there, but we wouldn't have a single view of what content um, is landing um, and um, who is interacting with that content and taking action as a base of that content. So I've been on a quest um, you know, for those 10 years to get there. It was easier to do, uh, uh, not easy, but easier in social media. And our partner there is Sprinkler uh, in PR and earned media and our partner there is Cision. Uh, and on OrgCom, our really strong partner has been Social Chorus. So um, with that, I'd like to um, kick it over to Nicole and then we'll have a little conversation and then answer any questions that you have. And just as a note to uh, my email address is available. I, I love connecting with folks offline as well. So if there are deeper questions or people have more things they wanna learn after this uh, hour together, uh, feel free to reach out directly and uh, we'll set something up. Great, thanks, Aura. So a, a fun fact, Oris and I both have three boys and we both live in Seattle. So um, that, that's a little piece. A quick background on me. So um, I founded Social Chorus a little over a decade ago and it came out of um, a personal experience I had had. I started my career at Enron and my bosses all went to jail. So I had the kind of wor worst of corporate America, worst of, um, leader communication gone awry. And so for, for me, it was, I will only start companies where I can control the culture and the ethics and ensure that an Enron situation doesn't happen again. And so for me personally, um, it's been so incredible to see some of the, the largest companies in the world and their leaders using our platform for authentic communication. Um, when we started Social Chorus, um, and again, it was over 10 years ago, we really looked across the, the, the C-suite and saw that the communications function was really the last function that didn't have their own internal platform and their measurement to show the impact. So just like Aura said, you, you've had tools on the external side um, and we really saw the opportunity for communications as a function to go where marketing had gone. And if you think about the, the past 20 years and everything that marketing automation has given to marketers, the data that's been given and how that's translated into internal budgets and, and really share a voice um, with the, the, the CEO and other leaders. So we really said, you know, how, how can we deliver to the, the leaders of communications, which we also believe is, is that the key to any organization. It's funny, I've, I've had a couple conversations with CEOs to remind them that nothing will actually happen in their business if there's not communications. And so um, we, we have this, um, we think of our platform really as that internal communications backbone um, and where everything in the organization can happen. We think of our, our product serving three different constituents. So one is, is the worker. So we have a goal to reach 100% of the workforce. Um, in addition to, to Providence, a lot of our other customers have a lot of um, non-wired workers. And so we want to reach everybody, provide them with a really incredible digital employee experience. So this means it's, it's personalized, it looks and feels like what they get in their consumer life, things come to them where they are. 
Um, so really focused on that, that digital employee experience. The second focus is on the communicator. And we think of the communicator both as big C, which is all of you and your teams, and the little C, which are, which are leaders. Anybody who needs to communicate to their team, we want to enable really impactful communications. Um, and so we have built some automation, taking the cue from marketing automation to enable communicators to have a, a key message target and retarget a specific audience and know immediately the impact of that organization. Um, and then the third constituent we look at is the organization as a whole. And we want to give communicators more data than they, they've ever had and not, not just data for data sake, but data that actually gives you true insights around your workforce and how, in order to say, how can we deliver more effective communications, but also how can we use some of this data to help steer our organization, um, especially in, in times like this. So the, the way that we um, bring this to life, um, we talk about our platform as communication mission control. So it's really one main place where you can plan your communications, create your communications, publish, author, host videos, initiate polls, target different audiences, run campaigns, and measure. Um, the other big, big change with kind of giving you this, this one main place is also giving you the ability to send those communications to wherever your employees are. So whether it is email or mobile or inside of SharePoint or inside of Teams or even to digital signage or another digital place, our point of view is we must meet our people where they are. And that's really the only way that we'll be able to reach 100% of our workforce with this communications backbone. Yeah, I'll also throw in there, Nicole, and also where we want them, uh, where they want us, sorry, <laughs> where they exactly. want to meet them. So uh, that's been an important part of it for us too. Yeah, and the notion of forcing everybody to one portal or one hub, it just doesn't work. I mean, we, we've all on the we've all tried that since the intranet became a thing. And we've seen, you know, it can work for a certain percentage of the population, which is fine. But in order to, to reach everyone, just like Aura said, we can't tell them where they want to spend their time. They know where they want to spend their time. And so it's our job to help give them what they need where they are. Um, and then the, the, the second big piece is um, the, really the, the, the data. And I think Oris touched on this and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about really what's possible if we can actually measure every interaction with communication down to the individual who's received it, what have they done with it, who are they, what's their tenure, what's their role, who's their line manager, to be able to give you all of this data in one single pane of glass um, and enable you to, to have deep insights. Um, you know, we believe that, that that's really the opportunity for, for ComTech in general um, and something that we obviously want to bring to all of our clients. Um, and then just quickly, in addition to, to Providence, we do work with some of the biggest brands in the, the world. So very, very well versed in large complex organizations. Um, so Oris, with that, let's let's talk to you. you. You talked a little bit about kind of where where you were at Providence. I know you've you've mentioned um, M and A, multiple ERPs. Can you just take us through a little bit of the stage when you arrived and and what made you realize, gosh, I really do need a, a partner to help me manage my the internal piece of my communications. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I, I do want to um, disclose that we're still on this journey too. So we're, um, I think we had a goal of by the sec end of second quarter this year, we're on a calendar year to be uh, fully implemented with social chorus and then COVID hit. And as a um, health system, obviously that um, put our focus on responding uh, to COVID. We treated the first case in the United States in our hospital in Everett, uh, Washington, and have been, needless to say, uh, involved in, in that from the beginning. Uh, that said, though, if we had done this before, uh, life would be very different from a communication standpoint right now. Um, and 
uh, especially in being able to measure, you know, who's interacting with what content and where, and then uh, matching that to see if there's correlation or causation with, um, you know, uh, less use of uh, or adherence to safety protocols internally. Uh, you can, as communicators, just imagine uh, the value of being able to to do that um, and know, you know, so for example, in, you know, and I'm obviously making this up, but if we can see that in Portland, uh, our caregivers aren't interacting with our uh, communication content, but they are in Missoula, Montana. And in Missoula, we had a uh, better adherence to safety protocols. Uh, we can't say it's because of our communication, but we can have a real conversation about the value of communication and, and then uh, change our communication approach in Portland uh, and see if that moves the needle on whatever we're measuring at that point. Uh, backing up a little bit, just philosophically, my, my passion has always been uh, creating content for our caregivers, uh, wherever I uh, worked for employees uh, that matches the content that we're creating for consumers. So really treating our um, employees and caregivers as, as true uh, consumers of, of um, information. And we use the word targets. We all, we all do. Um, I, I tell the team we use that behind, behind closed doors only. So not treating people as, as targets, but, but respecting that we're competing for their time. And the more compelling the stuff that we create can be, the more my hypothesis is, the more effective it is in moving action and behavior uh, with folks and driving culture for an organization. Being able to measure that is awesome. And uh, the frustration was spending money on this com compelling content and you know, hearing down in the hallway um, or on a phone call that somebody thought it was awesome, but not being able to show that it's actually driving action and changing behavior in the organization. So that's been has been and will remain my lifelong uh, quest. And um, not to say that it's uh, you know less or more important than external communication. It's all equally important. And in, in a lot of ways, internal is more important because it brings it to life externally. But you all know that part. Um, so uh, on this quest about, I don't know if it was five, six years ago, Nicole, maybe seven, um, I, I just asked the team, I was, uh, getting a bit frustrated, not knowing uh, at that time we had, you know, whatever, call it 50,000 employees and not knowing, um, you know, who uh, I call, you know, we've used this terminology before, but our tribe, who's really, who's really interacting with our content, who is talking about it, who's sharing it, who's engaging with it. And the team came back, they talked to a few uh, uh, partners, potential partners and came back and said, social chorus is the way to go. And at that time, it was an app um, that folks can download and or use on their desktop. We'd give them exclusive content. So we'd create stuff early. Sometimes we test it with uh, with folks. And we wouldn't we didn't know who would sign up for this. And that wasn't the point. I didn't put a goal on for the team saying we need 1000 people or 10,000 people on it. Just wanted to see who's doing it. And then the tool allowed folks to share on their social channels instantly. So we pre approved the content, nobody had to ask like, can I share this on Facebook or Twitter or, or Instagram, and we could watch who's doing that. Uh, and then start seeing like, hey, if 80% of the if 80% of the time, it's the same folks doing this, we're onto something. And they can be our communication leaders, they can help other others improve their communication, we can ask them, you know, why they're into it, you know, and for some people, it's career advancement, they want to hear what they're saying in corporate for other people, they're inspired by the mission messaging, there are all sorts of ways to do it. So from that, it evolved um, into uh, a communication tool. One of the barriers that we had is uh, that we are, uh, and this isn't the only barrier to it, but we're about 30% organized and we can't force, you know, our caregivers or employees that are in unions to download an app if, um, if they don't want to do it. Again, that's not the only good reason not to do that, to go that route, but we did realize that the app and the desktop experience wouldn't be the ultimate uh, single destination for folks. Uh, about the same time we upgraded all of our, you know, we went from like, I think it was Office 84 or something like that to um, all the online 365 stuff. So we had a, a bunch of new amazing communication tools and providentially, as we like to use that term here at Providence, but we did that about a month before COVID hit. Uh, so we didn't have teams a month before COVID hit and we implemented it system-wide, a lot of kicking and screaming from folks um, and then had these amazing tools to communicate across the enterprise. So Social Chorus allows us to use those channels. So if people prefer to be on SharePoint or get their information there or through email uh, or through the app, we, we know that and we can hit them everywhere or hit them specifically where they wanna be hit and then watch if they're interacting 
with the content. Nicole mentioned campaigns. We've used that, you know, we're, we have a goal for 100% vaccination or attestation on flu shots. So we can send those emails, uh, see who's opened them and know um, if that's, or, you know, make the correlation if that's driving action. So um, that's a lot of, you know, stuff that I just threw out there, but I uh, thought it was important for some context on it and then how we're using it. Ultimately, uh, now I've moved um, the deadline for the team to um, end of first quarter next year is what I'd love to see. So I've, you know, pushed it a little bit closer to uh, January on that, but by, you know, middle of next year, I'll have a dashboard um, that shows our share of peer voice uh, in earned media nationally and then locally in each of our communities. Uh, it'll have our um, social media uh, uh, metrics on that. So share of conversation, uh, you know, currently we're, we have a big push on mental and behavioral health. So we can see what share of conversation nationally we're, um, uh, we're influencing in that space. And there are a lot of other metrics there too. And I'll have our organizational communication, caregiver communication dashboard um, that uh, stands alongside those two and I'll have a complete picture of uh, how we're doing um, from a relationship building standpoint and communication internally, externally, uh, and in one clear view. And I'm excited about that. And almost sounds like, a, like a, you know, I'm making it up or science fiction when I say it, but, <laughs> um, but that's happening. So uh, any, uh, from there, Nicole, I'll let you ask any questions or anybody else. I'm, I'm sure I missed a bunch of stuff. Yeah, no, no, that's great. I just wanted to show everyone because I think that the the piece about meeting people where they are is so incredibly key. Um, and Oris mentioned, so our, our evolution as a company, we did start in the employee advocacy space and Providence along with um, AT&T and Whirlpool and some other were some some early customers of ours. And, and really what, what we learned when we're thinking about, about advocacy is you can't ask your people to shout from the rooftops how amazing your company or mission is unless they feel informed and supported and connected to the company. And so what we said was, wow, there's this real opportunity while if you, you almost if you think about it, a pyramid. And if you think about digital engagement, there's kind of the 1% of people who are the content creators who are very active, kind of the 9% who will, who will uh, maybe like and comment, and then the other 90% are, are there to consume. Um, we saw that that same behavior in advocacy and we said gosh there's a real opportunity um, to to enable the the full workforce with communication and the more people we have who who are engaged and inform the more they can advocate and you know advocate is is not just share to social that that's wonderful but especially you know it, with a with a um healthcare system it is about, about word of mouth and about sharing that patient experience and sharing um, the, the service that, that you got to others. Um, and so Prop Providence has been on, on that journey. Um, what Oris was talking about is the, the ability to, yes, there, there's a mobile app that people can choose to download with the um, organized workforce. Most of our, our customers have that. There's a... Um, legal terms and conditions, you basically say this is this is voluntary, non-compensable time. It's a choice to download the app and we're giving them that, that opportunity, um, but also being able to push things where people are, whether it's, it's inside of SharePoint, inside of Teams. So on the left-hand side, this is in sending content that's been created and, and orchestrated from the Social Chorus uh, studio and sent to Teams. Um, there's also an email on, on the right sent via Outlook. Um, and then Oris was talking about some of the, the stats. I think this example is looking at different initiatives that are being tracked by the team to see how those are doing. Um, and then there's the opportunity to filter, like he said, by location, even by tenure, by manager. So really being able to start to slice and dice the data um, and to be able to he said, ask questions that can really show that, that communication is, is driving the business, whether it's about a, a reduction in safety incidents, whether it's, you know, we, we've got to get to 100% um, flu shots or any of those other goals, really being able to, to tie communications to those other key business objectives. 
Yeah, an example of how we'll use this next year um, is we there, we have a, um, a hypothesis that um, most communicators share that people want to hear information from those who are closest to them. So their 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 direct supervisor or somebody close to them. Uh, there are times where we have to communicate from the top down from our CEO, and we do that very selectively, but COVID was a good example of that when we had better information centrally than we did locally uh, early on. That shifted um, as the, um, you know, as we grew into this pandemic, but um, next year when we have this all stood up, we'll be able to test that. So we'll be able to send messages from a, a CEO or somebody in the executive team nationally uh, uh, and then send similar messages locally and, and see what happens. Um, I think I know what will happen, but the cool thing is I'll know um, that we'll know. <laughs> we can actually measure it uh, next year. So just wanted to throw that in on that slide when I saw that slide. Yeah. And can you talk about, or you're doing something really interesting around your, your competence survey question? Yeah. So we have a uh, 109 people in our communication team and one shared goal that we each have. Everybody has you know, separate goals and teams have goals, but one shared goal is moving the dial on a caregiver experience survey. We do an annual survey. Uh, we do pulse checks too, but uh, the big test is annual where we get about 80, I think we're at 88% participation across 120,000 people this year, which is huge. Um, and one question on there uh, is about the confidence in the, in the future success of the organization. So I, I've, I've always uh, challenged the team, you know, uh, and nobody's taken me up on this to let me know how their role in communications does not influence our caregivers' confidence in the future of the organization. And if, that, if that's what we do. So it, we do that through PR, we do that through reputation management, we do that in social media, we do that in internal communication up and down the line. So we, um, that's our number. And we set aggressive goals to moving the dial on that. We acknowledge what we can't control. Uh, obviously didn't predict a pandemic that's gonna impact people's confidence in the success of the organization based on what's happening, not just in our hospitals and our clinics, but at home um, and everybody goes through different challenges. So we acknowledge all that and at the same time push toward um, movement in that number. So being able to see how our, contact, uh, our content impacts that uh, at, at, after we have this fully locked and loaded next year is again, gonna be incredible. It's gonna be an incredible gift for the team to know uh, and start making correlations and then testing hypotheses to see if there's causation or correlation where people are more confident in the future success of the organization or less uh, matched against who's interacting with our content and who isn't. Uh, so super excited about that too. Quick note on the app too, just um, this, it, it may uh, be obvious, but it's worth saying uh, for us, it's a uh, single sign on and no need to be on our network. So you could be, you know, well, I guess many people aren't in line at Starbucks. You can be physically distanced in line at Starbucks and uh, dial into your app to see what's happening uh, in the office, uh, or you can be in the office or, or at home. Uh, again, wherever you want to be uh, interacting with content. Uh, so I, I think it's an important feature for us as well. So we're clearly, you know, um, careful about what we put on there. Um, but I, again, another philosophy thing for me, I always say whatever is internal is external. So don't pretend like it's protected because, you know, once you hit that send button or communicate in any way you do, it's on the internet. So uh, that's been a powerful feature for us. Yeah, and it's, it's actually interesting when we look across the board across all of our, our platform uses. So we have we have about 8 million employees who are who are on the platform and on mobile specifically, we actually see about 15% of usage on the weekends, which we actually love. And we say this is something, you know, now weekend doesn't matter and not, not everybody has soccer games anymore, but it's something of if you're you're out and about and you do want to check in and see what's going on, that's that's a great way to do it. And, and back to that philosophy of really meeting our people where they are. And that's um, that started for, for me, you know, seven, six, seven years ago, uh, um, I traveled a lot, uh, not these days, but I did travel a lot. And I told the team, I can't even read our own stuff. Like I'm out, I'm at the airport, I'm in a hotel. I, I'm not, you know, I can't always get into VPN and dial in there. And if I'm not reading our stuff consistently, then forget about, you know, a nurse in a unit in the hospital floor reading our stuff. So uh, it's been, it's been a great tool for that. Yeah. So maybe maybe I'll step in here now because I think we've got 30 minutes left, Orst and Nicole. And so again, let me just uh, encourage people, if you have a question, uh, put it in the chat system, raise your hand, uh, let us know, and uh, and we'll 
take your question and just uh, please state your your name. But uh, let me maybe I'll kick it off with a couple questions um, to each of you. But to first, Orst, you know the the slide you had at the front end I thought was very compelling. You know that you had an eight times increase. The, photo, the one with the photo of me. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best one. Yes. <laughs> Although it was close with Nicole, you know, the, um, but the uh, but you know the X eight X increase in employee engagement, the twenty five percent increase that you've seen uh, uh, with management's engagement, and so yeah, and a four X increase in uh, in employee users, um, I thought were pretty compelling business case. And how hard was it to sell this into leadership? Uh, the importance of a platform like this. Question. Um, here it wasn't hard. One of the reasons I joined Providence is we have a, a very uh, progressive, from a communication standpoint, progressive CEO who believes in the power of communication. And um, I uh, have license to do what I need to do to show others the value of the work that we're doing. So super blessed to be in a position like this. I know it's, you know, based on where I have been in the past, it's not uh, the case everywhere. Um, so that, that said, I want to get ahead of it as well. So I want to be, I wanted to lead uh, in the effort and not just react and respond and wait for, for a new CEO to come in or for somebody to, the CFO to knock on the door and start asking questions. Right. Or to answer the phone. That's not, that's not good when leadership comes in and asks you why you're not doing it. Right? No, no. And uh, if it, when it, when it happens, I'll be ready. And not just for that reason, but it's uh, again, it shows our team and gives us the confidence that our work is making a difference uh, in what we're doing. So um, from that standpoint, it wasn't difficult. The other thing I was uh, kind of joking with Nicole the other day talking about this, but before marketing leaders had these tools, you know, they were kind of making it up as they were going along. And then suddenly all these rule, tools are available and organizations got a hold of them and all of our marketing colleagues got fired. So we don't want that to happen to us too. So <laughs> we want to own uh, and be transparent about what we're doing, what's working, and especially what's not working. That's the power uh, of this too. So yeah. Uh, again, that said, the important key, the key here was in our, our, um, our team's relationship with the CIO and the CIO's team. Uh, and Preston on our team, who may be on the call now, has deep relationships with our, um, throughout our IS organization. And HR obviously is important as well. As we added on new partners, we added on ERPs. So we're moving from eight to one ERP in the next year or two, which will be a game changer in how you know, we can load uh, stuff into social chorus and, uh, and manage our DLs and stuff like that. But that relationship has been, uh, has been key. We have a CIO who joined us from Microsoft about a year or two ago, um, and he's very forward thinking in this space. We, we actually went to Microsoft and said, you know, we, we're fully invested in your suite of products. Do you have anything like this? Do you have a publishing tool that we can use to measure and do all the things social chorus are doing? And, they very clearly said we do not. And um, so that was a good way to uh, lock in our new CIO to say this is an important tool uh, for us uh, moving forward too. Yeah. So then we, you know, we featured them in a bunch of white papers and blogs and stuff that she likes. Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, I think that, I think that's a really important point. The, uh, the changing relationship between the chief communications officer and the chief technology or the chief information officer and side of company today because it you know if you step back 10 years ago it was a very transactional kind of relationship but today we can't do our jobs without a partnership with the uh, the head of technology or the chief information officer so that's a, i think an incredible change that's taken place we've got a couple questions that have come in um and so i'm going to turn it over to carrie carrie do you want to ask your question unmute yourself and ask it or Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, this is Carrie Bjor, who's from Ecolab. And my question was this. Um, we have spent a lot of money over the last few years building our global intranet, which is a pretty sophisticated platform. Um, and we still aren't seeing the levels of engagement uh, that we would like, although they're certainly better than before. But having made this huge investment um, to recommend a new platform, even though there's a really compelling case for, for reaching people where they are, I'm just curious to know, how do you position the intranet within this platform and make the case for how it still was a worthwhile investment and is important part of the communications ecosystem? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And one, you know, I had a, um, 
hypothesis about our intranet that was completely wrong um, when we started measuring. I thought that you know people use it because they have to and they have no other choice and they hate it and it ends up that people, uh, our employees, our caregivers, uh, not only don't hate it, but in some cases love it because it's a one-stop shop for information for them beyond what we're producing from a you know from the formal capital C communication function, but uh, for their teams and everything else. So. Um, that that's what that was one of the moments where we realized the multi-channel uh, omni-channel approach is really really important um, and uh, and yeah so in the future we'll want to start shifting people from you know maybe one to the other uh, but uh, but again we got to respect people being where they are or wanting wanting information where they are a lot of our uh, clinical workforce uses workstations so an intranet is an ideal um, communication uh, tool for them and you know they'll sign in uh, there and then get like we'll get it custom tailored to them, but they don't necessarily have a computer they take home uh, or dial in to the VPN when they're when they're out of the office. So uh, for us, it's it's remained an important part of our our suite. And again, that was why it was important to work with the CIO because this is an investment. It is another tool that you're adding onto the deck. And uh, most good CIOs will come in and say you have you know eight thousand applications across the enterprise, and one of their metrics is slashing that number, not really. Um, always worried about what damage is, is done when that happens. So again, just building that those relationships with the uh, IS team and the CIO in particular have been really helpful to us. I hope that helped that helped or answer the question, Carrie. Yeah, Carrie. I, think, I think it's kind of a question of investment, having made a big investment, how do you justify an additional investment? And um, the other thing too, I think is that uh, there are so many um, elements of, of, of interaction available within the Microsoft suite, you know, the whole team's environment and how does that align? And uh, so I think our, I'm imagining my conversation with our IT leader and he would probably say, hey, we have the full suite of tools here within the Microsoft suite that you're not fully leveraging already. What, uh, did that come up with you? And was, was that something that was talked about? Well, we started with the power of those Microsoft tools as separate channels and acknowledge that. Again, the SharePoint point you made is, is part of that saying people are going to SharePoint. It's important that we continue to, to uh, make a bit information available to them there. Um, what I said I don't have is a way to, uh, to know who's interacting with our content and where unless I use separate tools. So right now I have five, you know, I think we use, um, I think it's five different vendors right now because we have regional communication functions that have had, you know, they've always been interested in measuring. So I have no single view on that. So I started with the power of the tools we have now. This isn't a replacement for any Microsoft or any other tool that we have, but it's a way for the communication team to be able to, be able to create, to articulate value to the C-suite in a way we haven't been able to before. And, um, you know, if that's important to the C-suite, that's where we'll be successful. If it's not, then it's a huge barrier because it is another tool that you're adding to the tool set that some might not see value in. Yeah, and Carrie, just to chime in, the way that we've worked with others who have made big investments in their intranet is as or so at centralizing all the publishing. So you're you're streamlining all of the publishing. You're still sending all of that content, whether it's into to SharePoint or into Teams. And then what we've also seen is because you have that omni-channel approach, you will see the engagement across the channels. And to Oris put you, then you can measure it. So we we are able to pull back the 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 engagement data from those other systems. And so it's the, the ability, again, we, we, can't, we can't force people to, to one place as it sounds like you've, you've seen even with all that new investment, but what you can do is, is centralize and streamline at, at point of publishing and therefore unify those analytics. So um, our next question uh, is from Paul Healy. Paul, do you wanna state your question? Yeah, thanks, Dave. So I'm Paul Healy, and I actually work for Page. Uh, I'm leading the charge on the new Learning Academy, which will be launched next year. Uh, Oris, I really enjoyed your your talk. Um, I'm specifically interested in the people side of this. So uh, you mentioned you had over 100 people on team, and I'd like to hear a little bit about what sort of team you need and and what skills are on it to to run a platform like this and run an internal function like this. Yeah. Um, so we. 
uh, our organization is deeply matrixed. So we have, you know, we have horizontals, we have verticals, we have diagonals, we have spirals, and um, we're moving toward a more cohesive operating um, structure. Uh, so with that, the team, you know, we used to try to lead and anticipate where the organization was going um, from a communication team standpoint, that failed. That's not, not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> really, it wasn't for us. So now uh, we're watching what the organization does, and then uh, and then building to that, and, and anticipating that. So building the skill set that we need in anticipation of um, uh, functional changes within the organization. So that's one. So currently, that we're organized. We have uh, seven regions, and they're geographic regions. We have three vertical lines of business that go across all the regions, and then we have shared services that serve across. Uh, all of the regions as well. So our team has, um, depending on the size of the region, we have communication folks who uh, lead community relations uh, in those regions and then organizational communication, media relations, all the things that we do nationally uh, at the local level. Um, and then we have, um, at, from a shared service standpoint, our social media team, our PR, our national communication PR and um, uh, thought leadership and reputation management uh, team, and then orgcom, an organizational communication team. I believe has about eight people, eight or ten people on it. Not not enough right now. But again, with some orgcom folks sitting in regions and in lines of business, we um, we work together. So it's more than just those folks that are there. From an expertise standpoint, uh, we just. Um, uh, Preston, who I believe is on the call, I'm not going to give his last name because I want him to stay at Providence forever. Um, but joint Preston Smith uh, has just moved into a director of operations position reporting into me so that we can accelerate implementation of um, social chorus and build a dashboard that has social chorus sprinkler incision information all in one place for us so that we can again start articulating the leadership the work that we're doing um, and uh, you know that, that that's been an important move because Preston was in organizational communication and um, spread too thin. So we, too much on his plate and uh, did a great job on uh, both orgcom and on social chorus, but couldn't fully focus on social chorus. And the important part of fully focusing is helping folks in the regions who might be skeptical about it because it's something new and they have a lot of other stuff going on, but to show how this tool will ease their way and make, actually make their life easier. Um, and um, so Preston just started that on Monday. Uh, and that, that's been an important move for us uh, in terms of how we're putting our department together. Uh, we're always thinking about what's next and trying to uh, ensure we have the skills on the team to, um, to match, match those needs. Uh, our, uh, Forrest and Nicole, our next question is from Lars uh, with Equinor in Norway. Uh, Lars, you want to ask your question? Thank you and thanks for, for allow me, allowing me in here. Uh, I have a question regarding how, how do you actually do the tracking of the employees' engagement with the content, how, how is that set up technically, and does that sort of scale across from the office suite to the intranet? Uh, I'm curious to know about uh, that, and then just to to also understand: is Social Chorus uh, a content management system with uh, APIs out to these various channels, or or how does that work? Thanks. And I also had the question on GDPR, but I guess that's only for European uh, All people. Right. Before, before I asked Nicole to jump in on that, I did. I learned a new um, Norwegian, I think it's the Norwegian word, freelutsleaf. Is that, did I say that correctly? Yeah. Well <laughs> right. done. What does it mean? Uh, it means um, taking joy in uh, isolation outdoors, um, not necessarily oh. isolation, but maybe with a couple people who you love. And uh, yeah, we have a place out in the mountains about an hour from town. And I was enjoying some of that this weekend. So anyway, <laughs> nice to meet you, Lars. I love that word. Um, so quickly on the, on the GDPR piece, so we, we are GDPR compliant and users can ask to be forgotten. Um, we also have a way because of the, the increased um, privacy standards across Europe to anonymize certain data. So, so obviously there's the power in the data, one to know, as Laura said, who, who's done what, um, to, to use that information to correlate to other business objectives and to do better targeting. Um, so we, we have to, to do with, with what we can um, in Europe. 
on the, the other side, the way that we're able to, to track the engagement in other systems is um, through, through APIs. So depending on how the integrations work, we have some embeddable widgets, which allow the, the interaction or the engagement with the content inside of the SharePoint container, for example. And so that's, we'll, we'll, we um, do all of our, our tracking natively, so that'll come back. And then for, for other places um, where there's a, a bot or an app type of integration with Teams, um, with Slack, with others, it's via the API. Okay. Uh, Amer, you have a question on pricing. Yeah, Nicole, I'm just curious as to how you price it. Is it a per seat employee uh, pricing model or do you go via channels or the complexity of what you're trying to measure? Yeah, it's really, so there's there's a kind of a baseline platform fee that gives you all of the, the publisher, the CMS, the targeting, and that includes a couple endpoints. So it does include our native mobile app. We have a, a desktop experience that actually some of our clients are using as an, an internet refresh or as that digital homepage, um, publishing direct to email, so via Outlook or, or whatever your, your provider is. And then usually based on the platform, it can include a couple other endpoints. So if you say, I want it to, to be in Teams or SharePoint or Salesforce or we have, a, um, you know, I have this app for my drivers or something else that I've built. So usually it'll include a couple of those endpoints and then there's a small per user fee on top of that. Um, so, so could you just give me a sense of we're talking between X amount or possibly this amount? I just, I just want to get a, a sense of what the investment would look like. Um, I, I know you can't give a specific price, but I, I just, what kind of money are we talking about? Yeah, it depends on the size of org. So for the very, very smallest, so call it um, our platform license goes anywhere between 50 and 200,000 annual. Um, and then the, the per user goes anywhere from call it $5 to $25 per year per seat. And again, it's all depending on um, number of users. So um, let, me, let me ask a, a, another question, and this really is for you, Nicole. I mean, mm -hmm. what are you learning? I mean, you you talked about all the companies that you're now working for. Obviously, you've been around for some time. Uh, what have you learned from your customers that have allowed you to advance the platform? Yeah, I think we've, and we continue that, that's a huge part of how we continue to innovate. We have a customer advisory board, Orist um, is on that. So we, we're always learning from feedback from our communicators, from executives who are looking at data and from end users. And then we're, we're obviously looking at, at data across the board. Um, but I think that the biggest thing is just, um, I think on the worker side, people, people want more personalized information targeted to them where they are, um, especially now there, there's increased noise. And so it's how do we deliver that, that signal through the noise and how do we make sure from, again, the, the employee standpoint, I get for what I need from my employer. Um, and that really does help them get through the day. And then we were also learning from our communicators that they, they do want a better way to help associate and, and um, target those types of communications for the action or the impact and really think about the intention. So, you know, we, we used to be in a world where you just publish everything to one place in your intranet and whatever people see, that's it. But, you know, if we think about how we consume information in our personal lives, it's, it's the same concept. We want things that are hyper-personalized to us, targeted to our needs, wherever I am um, to, to give me that, um, to help me take that action and the, for the, um, you know, the, the organization to yeah. get back data. So those are the, the main um, trends that I think we're, we're seeing. Yeah. And as Aura said, just, I think the data keeps coming up more and more too. I think that's, I think that's a good point that companies are now just catching up to what the experience has been for people away from work in terms of how they interact with technology, access information and stuff. And so that's a big, I think, uh, an important point. Uh, Sally, uh, you had a question. Why don't you go ahead and 
and yep. ask. Thanks, Dave. So it was really building on Amer's question, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, um, for a budget commitment like this, um, you know, clearly we see value from a communications perspective, but I'm just curious how you sold that in to the organization that this would be a worthwhile um, use of your budget to invest in this. Yeah, so we, I started small um, and then started deprioritizing other things to make room for, uh, for this as, as um, it grew, um, you know, as our commitment to it, to the tool grew. Um, so, and, and I don't want to speak for Nicole here, but there are ways of, of doing, you know, experiments and showing the value that come from those experiments or not, you know, it, maybe it's not right for everybody, but, um, and then, and then using that, uh, evidence to say, Hey, if we do this on a broader scale, here's, uh, here's the value we can bring, uh, to the organization. So that's one way to do it for, for me also, it's, um, you know, ideally we're, we'd be in a place, and I know this isn't um, always the case or almost never the case where we have a, a budget and then as communication leaders, we decide what to do with that budget. And then um, people hold us accountable for results. And if we don't hit the results, we go do this, try to do it somewhere else. Um, but uh, that's not the case even here. So uh, with the uh, budget review meetings, I always show what we're shutting down as we're ramping up. And then with the partnership with the CIO, um, I hope he's not listening, but the goal is to have IS pick up the tab on this because it is a digital tool that we're using. Uh, we didn't want that to happen too early because it's too easy for them to shut things down. So building the, that relationship with the CIO, showing the value it's bringing and really hardwiring this uh, in the organization. Uh, and so it becomes uh, a non-negotiable to, to shut it down and then transferring budget is my um, ultimate plan. On it. So start small, strategy. Small, <laughs> yeah, start small, show success, and build on that. And Sally, we're seeing that across the board. I think that bringing bringing IT in, I think, is when we're going out to to um, new potential customers, it becomes a, a buying committee. That's op, that's usually the the head of communications, definitely the CIO. Sometimes there are you know the CHRO is is usually there, and sometimes it's even at the CEO level. And we're saying, how can this really guide? How can we get um, efficiencies from either shutting some other systems or making our people more productive? And the data that we'll be able to get to really help to, to guide our business. And I think when, with all of those stakeholders, um, we see that that's that as an organizational decision, people get to, you know, we can't not do this. Um, and most CIOs, frankly, they'll say, you know, it's a matter of time before we do have to make this investment. So, you know, may as well do it now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we have a couple minutes uh, left here before we have to wrap up. But, you know, one of the things you've said a few times, Orst, is, you know, that this has allowed you and you've been used this to articulate value back to the C-suite. Um, you talked you know, about value that you can uh, be using to, to help the organization. And so, you know, <clears throat> do you believe that, you know, the, the application of ComTech, the application of these tools is helping you move from simply being viewed as a cost center inside of uh, Providence to really being viewed as a value center? 100%. Yeah. And I think there's no other way other than anecdote to convey that uh, to folks in the C-suite. So, um, you know, in one way, like I said, I'm blessed. We have a CIO, CEO who's um, who is a communicator at heart, um, but he's not surrounded by people of the same ilk. So uh, it is absolutely essential uh, for me. And um, and people, folks tend to understand or appreciate. And maybe I'm just speaking for our C-suite um, external communication um, much more readily than they do internal, which is uh, a, you know one of the reasons we started with social media and measuring that and showing the value of our activity there and um, PR and earned media uh, as well. People just kind of understand it. You know, it's um, so that, that's been the case here and then bringing them along on the journey that, you know, basically I say none of that stuff matters if we don't get it right internally. If 120,000 people aren't on board, then right. uh, our third parties are, you know, could be helpful, but um, it, it won't be long lasting relationships that we're building out there. So yeah, yeah. 100 Dave. And on, and on that point, I mean, have you, is the social chorus and maybe Nicole, I don't know if it's better for you or Ors, but can it also really help you um, track employee sentiment on a real-time basis? 
Yeah, Dave, that's exactly where where we're going. So our view is if you think about, you know, communications is this back when all of these different um, points of engagement with those communications that will give organizations this real time pulse mm -hmm. on where and how people are engaged. So so our our vision um, and what we're building is instead of saying, OK, let's do a, a survey once a year it's a point in time, now we can actually take the data from how they're engaging with these different forms of communications and deliver them some pulse polls. So to be able to pull that sentiment and do it on a much more um, real time basis. Yeah, so it's really becoming a continuous listening capability. Exactly. All right, well, we're, we're almost at time here. So maybe I'm gonna just, uh, <clears throat> let each of you make a final point uh, and we'll start with you Nicole and then we'll wrap with Orst and yeah I just I just think that you guys all are, are in um, phenomenal roles and and now is the the time to kind of em embrace comtech and then as Aura said it's the you know data will set you free once we can show that the communication does indeed drive the business um, it's Kind of yeah. nothing that's the you know nothing gets in the way from there so super excited excellent and uh orst yeah thanks, like thanks parting words of wisdom yeah thanks everybody for listening i'll just say and um you know nicole didn't pay me to say this we actually pay them for the tool um but <laughs> just the passion that nicole and her team bring to communication is um what makes this work so the journey we've been on for for seven years the evolution of that has been amazing about two and a half years ago, we brought in um, another um, company that does similar work and uh, just to do the due diligence to see if we're on the right path, knowing that we're gonna go big, uh, big on this tool. And the differentiator there, um, you know, there were some minor ones on UI and things like that. Nicole probably thinks they're bigger than minor, but the biggest differentiator was the understanding of the power of communication uh, and what a tool can do. So it's not about the tool, it's about uh, what we do with it, how we use it to, drive change and um, uh, and build the cultures we're working to build in our organizations. So right. that's my endorsement for uh, for Social Chorus in terms of just the, the people they bring on board, um, understand the work, love the work, and wanna, wanna see us all shine. All right, well, Oris, thank you so much for your time today, for the terrific work that you're doing on behalf of Providence um, and for helping educate you know all of us as members of page and Nicole I want to just thank you again for being you know our second page patron uh, we have others that we'll be bringing forward to through webinars um, over the coming months and so uh, with for everybody on the phone we will be sharing the information um, of how to get in touch with Orst if you wish to have follow up with him and he's invited you to do that as well as Nicole's uh, contact information so with that I'm going to call it a wrap and again say thank you to everyone for joining us today uh, have a great week take care thank you thank you bye